Joining me now, our regular panel, Stephen Conroy and Michael Kroger. Stephen, first of all, the end of an era for Tasmanian Labor politics. Rebecca White calling it a day. Yeah, look, I mean, if anyone has been unlucky in politics in Tasmania, it's been Rebecca. She's been an absolute Trojan for the party. Uh, she's now contested three. I completely understand her decision to step away. I hope she still has a future in politics. Uh, but uh, she has just been in politics is cruel. There she's is only 41. Yeah, as Do I said. you think say, she might, I, I would hope might get that called she on still to run has, in... I would hope she still has a future in politics. What about Lyons, the uh, federal well, seat? Well, we, we have a sitting member, uh, but she's young enough to be able to be patient around, you know, maybe she could contest the Wilkie seat. Uh, but, look, that's for her to think about. I'm sure she would like to actually just take a deep breath and, and uh, relax before she considered other options. But I hope she's not lost to politics. I think she's been a very, very good contributor for, for Labor in Tasmania. Michael, the Tasmanian election reminded us of the, the power of and the popularity of the independent senator, Jackie Lambie. Yeah, great coverage on Saturday night, by the way. It was um, pretty riveting all night for all sorts of reasons. Um, yeah, Jackie's obviously very important. She's, a, she's going to be the queen maker uh, in Tasmania. But... I'll tell you what's a bit lost in this is the fascinating... You mentioned it, you touched on it before. On Saturday night, Rebecca White, the Labor leader, was toying with the idea of a minority government. It was very clear from her lack of concession, as you said on Saturday night, another victory speech. They all go victory speeches. She was obviously toying with her 10, maybe 11, the Greens 5, 6, whatever, and cobbling together the former Labor leader, O'Byrne, and maybe one or two other independents. She was obviously contemplating an 18-seat minority Labor government. And then, obviously, what's happened on Sunday and Monday is that uh, they've said to her, there's no way we're getting into a, a, a government in any way, shape or form with the Greens. So forget about that. So I suspect... I'm interested to hear Stephen's views. I suspect federal Labor have said to the Tasmanian division... There's no way you're having a minority government with the Greens because that'll kill us federally, which it would. So whoever said to her federally from the federal division, this ain't happening, um, they've certainly saved the Albanese government from a lot of pain. But as I said, big difference from her speech on Saturday night to today, Kieran. That's a, yeah, long time in politics, a couple of days, because it went from her being... a trying to keep that option open, Stephen, yeah, look, as, as mm -hmm. Michael rightly pointed out, to today, tapping the mat. And, and you'd have to think it would have been a disaster if... And Helen Polly look, made this point on, yeah. this, no, no, I, on I, this desk I on mean, Saturday Helen night. Is, Helen is obviously, you know, very switched on to what goes in Tasmania. I, to, to be fair to Michael, I don't think it needed Abbo or anyone in Abbo's office to make a call. I think there is sufficient corporate memory of the disaster of the coalition Labor Green government inside the Tasmanian Party, that the Tasmanian Party were revulsed by the process, prospect of having to deal with those Greens. So I think the vast majority, I mean, Rebecca, you know, early on you weren't sure what the numbers were going to be like. Certainly the Liberals had a massive hit. But I think ultimately a whole bunch of wise heads down in Tasmania said no. We, we don't want this. I don't think it needed anyone in Canberra to phone and say this would be a disaster. I think their revulsion at the prospect of being in bed with them again stopped it cold. Not, not exactly the clarity or certainty that Jeremy Rockliffe <laughs> had hoped for, Michael, but it does look like that stadium's going to happen one way or another with them back in power and, incidentally, winning a record fourth term now for the Liberal government. Well, winning a fourth term, not entirely convincingly, I might say, KG, but good on them for winning four terms. They're very hard to do, as I keep saying. Uh, that's a lot of money in a stadium. As Stephen has said, 700 million is probably a billion dollars. Boy, that's a big that's a big call in an economic crisis, and no one is suffering more than Tasmania. Um, that's a big call. Uh, but by the way, um, Stephen, someone and that Helen Polly on Saturday night was the Labor senator. She was terrific. She saw very clearly. She saw very clearly what the future would be for the federal Labor government <laughs> if, if they got... If they, yeah. She picked it in one. I'm thinking, hmm, but uh, I thought, well, she's, uh, she's ahead of the game because she picked it, but no-one told the Labor leader, whose speech on Saturday night, as I said, uh, was very yeah. much, uh, well, I can cobble this together without saying these words, and I'll be Premier. That's what you... So, Stephen, no-one told your leader that this wasn't happening except for that Labor senator on the panel 
she was very switched on to the uh, to the complications that would arise if you got into bed with the Greens. Um, for a start, it would lose every single Jewish voter in the whole country uh, if Labor got into bed with the Greens. So but that's a good anyway. a good reminder to um for for all to keep watching. Sky News on election nights. Now, the migration mm. amendment bill that was introduced today by Andrew Giles, what do you make of that? A very hard line yeah, well, trying to circumvent another court-inspired The High Court have... Look, the High Court have made a decision. Uh, I think it shocked the Liberals. I think it was their legislation. Uh, then there, we moved a string of amendments at short notice, be encouraged and supported by the Liberals. But I think this one will give the certainty that uh, we can't have this situation where people can just say, I can't go home, uh, I refuse to cooperate, uh, and therefore they get to stay because that is an open invitation to people smokers to just say, look, it'll be tough for a few years, you just got to tough it out on an island or, you know, somewhere. Uh, and this legislation sends a very clear message, a very clear message to people smugglers end your trade, there is no value, you can't sell this, uh, this brochure with Australia's name on it, forget it. Dan Teen's going to join us in a moment, Michael, but you would imagine, even though the Coalition will say, oh, this is a mess, you're rushing it, and so on, they would be supporting this before the Parliament rises ahead of Easter this, this week, you'd imagine. Of course, they must support the legislation. Um, uh, it's got some very important elements in it, as Stephen has just said. I mean, people that don't cooperate with with the authorities uh, that have no valid right to stay here, their country won't cooperate with them. I mean, the basic tenets of this legislation appear to me to be correct. Uh, the only problem is that... <laughs> why do I get the impression that Mr Giles is not really on top of his brief? Everything is hurried, last minute, et cetera, et cetera, panicked. Uh, which, which, of course, creates, you know, serious complications in the Senate because you're asking the... Senators, particularly the guy from the ACT, you're asking individual senators who've got to be across every single portfolio with limited staff now to read this legislation, understand it and vote on it tonight. It puts enormous pressure on the independents, which is why you need, as Dan Tian and uh, James Patterson have said correctly, you actually need time to read these, these bills, formulate what amendments you need and not panic throw it through the reps and then the Senate uh, because you put the legislation at risk. If I, could, if I could just remind Michael, I was in the Parliament when John Howard, at 6 o'clock in the evening, called Kim Beasley in and presented him with a bill called the Tampa Bill uh, and said, I want this passed. I'm, bring, I'm tabling it at 7 tonight in the House of Reps. I want it passed by the uh, tomorrow. I spoke at 2.30 in the morning in the Senate on this bill. So, Michael, uh, migration bills have a long history of being rushed through Parliament. Uh, so I spoke at 2.30 in the morning on the floor of the Senate about John Howard's original Tampa legislation. You could be making a, uh, a prescient uh, forecast. It was obviously a very good speech. It was, Steve. Might be a long but sitting Steve, tonight. John Howard, it was excellent. John Howard didn't introduce legislation every month. He didn't panic legislation every month. The Tampa arrived. It needed to be dealt with. But this guy, Giles, is introducing this panic legislation every month or so. I mean, you get no impressions no, on the, top of things. Let, Michael, Michael, you're gilding the lily here. The Liberals demanded that there be... And the media, particularly the Sydney media, demanded that this legislation should have been ready. It should have been... We hadn't even seen the decision. Reasoning, OK? And people tried to make that point. Didn't stop the Liberal Party saying Labor's incompetent, the media saying Labor's incompetent. They should have known this was coming. They should have had the bill drafted before the reasons. And the reason we've had some of the problems is because the Liberal Party wanted to play politics and simply demand a legislative fix without even seeing the reasons for the original decision. So we've got them. This is legislation that looks pretty no. clear-cut. We've got to wrap it up. Mm. Stephen, Michael, thanks. See you next week.